So Rajesh, coming back to the Kashmiri Pandit's um, issue, what about the human rights group? Uh, don't you think that they have supported them on many occasions? I have been a human rights lawyer myself, Ananya, and sad to say, my experience with the human rights community in India is that they have not supported the Kashmiri Pandits. Something terrible happened, but nobody came forward to help them. The Indian government didn't help them. The Congress didn't help them. The BJP didn't help them. No government helped them. And not only that, the civil society doesn't seem to have helped them either. Human rights lawyers in India, they support campaigns against the presence of the army. You have somebody like Prashant Bhushan who feels a plebiscite should be held on the presence of the army. But those same human rights groups, they will not come forward to defend the situation, the case that Kashmiri Pandits must go back to the valley and a way must be found to make sure that they are safe in the valley. They must be properly housed, they must be made to feel secure. Nothing is happening, nothing has happened. I have spoken to some Supreme Court lawyers who work on human rights and have said, why don't you take up the issue of the Kashmiri Pandits? And I have been shocked to see their reaction. They say, oh, you know, historically, the Pandits used to oppress the Muslims. I said, when are you talking about? This is ancient times. And the Pandits were not in any case in power at that time. That was maybe during the time when the Afghans were in power or before, or some other time when the Sikhs were in power. There may have been some complaints against the Kashmiri Pandits. But to say that you are going to use that to justify why you are not going to take up the issue of Kashmiri Pandits is terrible. Uh, this just tells me that the human rights movement in India to a large extent is directed by overseas. There is a colonization of the human rights movement in India because they are not taking up honest, authentic, authentic agendas which they should be taking. There is simply no excuse why people haven't come forward to try and help the Kashmiri Pandits return. As a matter of fact, I would say that uh, the Kashmiri Muslims have lost the right to claim that they should have exclusivity in the right of ownership of property in Kashmir. Once the pundits have been thrown out, and it's not a small number, hundreds of thousands of pundits have been thrown out, all their properties are lying there. Why should we say that only Kashmiri Muslims can buy them? Only the people who threw them out can buy those Kashmiri pundit properties. That is something so terrible. And as this play goes on to discuss, once you know the Pandit family is thrown out, they come to Delhi, there are shopkeepers who come in from Srinagar, they think they can get the Pandit property at throwaway price. So uh, we here are uh, so concerned about refugees in neighboring countries, which we should be. For example, there are hundreds of thousands of Rohingyas who fled and who are now being housed in refugee camps in Bangladesh. India also housed some of those Rohingya refugees. But the point is that before 1990, there were anything, according to certain estimates, between 300,000 to 600,000 Kashmiri Pandits who were living in the valley and neighboring areas in Indian administered Kashmir. And now there are just a few thousand. So all those people, you know, they have been thrown out of a place in their own country where they lived for thousands of years. How can we tolerate this? So there's a deep hypocrisy within the human rights movement in India. There's overseas funding which distorts the narrative. There is a colonization of the human rights movement. And this is uh, a very important reason why something so important as this has not come to the forefront. So Rajesh, how did the readers react to this play? The reviews have been a bit saddening and also heartening. Saddening because out of say 50 reviews, 45 people have written, and these are mostly young readers, young viewers. 45 of them have said, We didn't know this had happened. We didn't know that pundits had suffered so much. And uh, so, you know, uh, it's terrible the level of ignorance. But that also brings me to the issue of our media. Our media has not been entirely honest. You know, there has been a dishonesty about the media. They have not covered the situation properly. The Kashmiri Pandit situation has not been highlighted. They seem to be, have been 
deliberate attempt to play down what happened to the Kashmiris. In fact, there have been even rumors set aside in the media that, oh, you know, this was a deliberate ruse by the Indian government. The Indian government got the pundits expelled deliberately because they wanted to clamp down on the freedom movement. These lies have been spread. There is comparatively little literature which controverts it. There is a book by Rahul Pandit, My Moon Has Blood Clots, which speaks about the actual incidents which affected his own family, which compelled his family to leave Kashmir. And, uh, uh, but this narrative has been drowned under a larger narrative which is more popular and uh, is unfortunate. So Rajesh, why is it that Pakistan is so hell-bent in intervening in the Kashmir issue? Pakistan has been troubling us since uh, independence, actually in 1948. You remember how they started a proxy war and they sent the Pashtun tribesmen to grab Kashmir and then you know the Raja came to India. He requested Pandit Nehru for help, which we provided. And then there was an instrument of accession signed. But uh, what has really made Pakistan determined to break up India, so to speak, is what happened to them in 1971, the creation of Bangladesh. So a lot of Pakistanis, they feel, especially the ones who are there in the Pakistani army, that India is to blame for Pakistan's breakup. This is not true. But yes, it is true that India supported the Mukti Bahini because that was the right thing to do. So Pakistan was broken up. It was shattered into two pieces. Why I say that India was not responsible was because Pakistan, as it exists now, they were responsible. It was anybody's guess. The Bangladeshis strongly outnumbered the northern Pakistanis. The northern Pakistanis were divided in any case between Baluchis, Sindhis, Punjabis. The Bangladeshis were one. So they had to win the elections. But the northern Pakistanis thought themselves to be superior, they could not stomach that Bangladeshi would be setting the agenda, there would be a Bangladeshi Prime Minister. So they started oppressing, there was a military dictatorship, they started, they countermanded the results of the election, which put Mujibur Rahman as the future Prime Minister. The war started and there was rape and genocide on a mass scale, India intervened and uh, Bangladesh was created. But as a consequence, Pakistan was cut into half. It lost half its nation. This was a wound in the Pakistani psyche. And they said, we are going to do the same to India. You broke us into two, we will cut off your head. So there are uh, men and women in Pakistan who feel that we have to do to India what happened to us. But this is very foolish. Pakistani intellectuals, right-thinking people in Pakistan, they realize this is a blunder which they are committing, which will hit them very badly as well. I mean, Pakistan is half of what happened after 1971. It's just half the country that remained. But even today, you know, if you look at Pakistan, half the country is occupied by a province called Baluchistan. Baluchistan forms more than half of Pakistan. But the Baluchis, they are already have waging an independence movement. They want to be free from Pakistan. So at the outset of the play, I go into the motivations. There's a discussion between a Pakistani ISI general who's talking about, we not only must we have revenge against India, we must severe Kashmir from it and make up for the lost territory we lost Bangladesh, we will get this Kashmir to join us. So it's actually not a narrative which is talking about the freedom of the Kashmiris. That is just a ploy, a trick used by the Pakistanis. The narrative, the real narrative is very clear. They want to wrest India administered Kashmir from India and annex it, attach it to Pakistan, you know, get back some of their lost territory in this way. So their bona fides are completely, you know, uh, there are no bona fides at all. Uh, if Pakistan were to lose Baluchistan tomorrow, 
which I would say is not something which is completely unfeasible, nothing would remain. And if they allowed Baluchistan to leave and Pakistan occupied Kashmir to leave as well. I mean, they talk about independence for Kashmir, but they don't talk about independence for the Pakistan occupied Kashmir. Are they going to make them free? They lost Bangladesh. They may lose Baluchistan. Are they going to say, okay, Pakistan occupied Kashmir can also be independent? What will remain of Pakistan? What remains will also be broken up in that case. So Pakistan, in these circumstances, it is waging this war, this foolish war, you know, using armed insurgents, people who are monsters. Uh, all the characters in my play are fictional, but there is one character who is real, Hafiz Saeed, who, as most of us know, was the acting commander of the lashkar e taiba the organization that was responsible for the massacres in Mumbai. Now, this is the same organization which is involved in uh, spending money to recruit unemployed youth in Kashmir, spending money to get young children to stone the Indian Army. And uh, unfortunately, as the reviewers to my play wrote, they are ignorant about many aspects because the Indian media doesn't tell them. The Indian government doesn't tell them. The Hindu Pandit expulsion narrative has not been properly explained not only to the world, but to Indians. So uh, uh, it's very sad. On the other hand, you have so-called intellectuals like Arundhati Roy, like Pankaj Mishra, uh, people who have no loy loyalty to the nation, who are just driven by their own agendas. And they talk about the independence of Kashmir in a vacuum. I mean, theoretically, if India granted were to, I'm just saying for the theoretically, if this was done, within days, Pakistan would attempt to annex it. There's no doubt in anybody's mind. Pakistan would not say, OK, you made Kashmir independent. Now we are going to make Pakistan administered Kashmir independent as well. What is stopping them from doing that right now? Why don't the separatists in Kashmir, why don't they say, Pakistan, you want to prove your bona fides? Make Pakistan occupied Kashmir independent tomorrow. That is not part of the narrative. Pakistan is a shadow of its former self, which included Bangladesh. Baluchistan may break away if they were to lose Pakistan occupied Kashmir as well, what will be left as a nation? And don't also forget that area is very rich in minerals. There's lots of water. So uh, uh, these are things which we need to understand. And uh, it's terrible that our media, our newspapers, our opinion makers, uh, they don't sort of have a proper nationalistic perspective on it. If you are nationalistic about the issue, you are branded as right wing, and that's unfortunate. Just because you talk about Kashmiri Pandits, their sufferings, their rights, their legitimacy of their return, there are people in this country who will say, oh, you're a right wing. You're an apologist for the nationalists, the ultra-nationalists. It's good to be nationalist. If Arundhati Roy were to go to the United Kingdom and talk about how Scotland was oppressed, or if she went to the United States and she said, oh, you know, United States took away territories like New Mexico and Louisiana from Mexico, they should be returned to Mexico. She would be thrown out. She would be dismissed. But if she goes there and she talks about Kashmir, she is fated as a human rights defender. There's nothing human rights about it. If she wants to defend human rights, charity has to begin at home. We cannot allow Hindu Pandits to become refugees in their own land. Which nation? Which nation worth its salt will allow its own people to be become refugees in this fashion? So I hope, and the Kashmiri Pandits, you know, they don't have a powerful voice. I should say here that even Bollywood is biased. They will make films like Haider. They will make films like, you know, Land Without Fathers or whatever that is. But they will not make a film which talks about what happened to people within their own country, how they became homeless, how they became refugees. Why? 
because they are looking at box for office numbers. They are looking at what is driving international agendas. I'm saying, be aware of international agendas. Look to your own national interest. If you don't, your nation will suffer. And uh, anybody who is a genuine patriot, he will feel for the Kashmiri Pandits. He will speak for the Kashmiri Pandits. He will want them to return to their home. Come hell high, hell high or high water, they have to go back. They have lived there for thousands of years. How can we allow this atrocity in their own country to become homeless, to become refugees? So more people should speak about it. So Rajesh, can you tell us a bit more about Kashmiriyat? Uh, hi Ananya, yes. Kashmiriyat to my mind represented a very tolerant version of Islam. Just like you have the Kurds in uh, Kurdistan or part, not, part of northern Iraq who represent a very moderate and free thinking version of Islam. Kashmiriyat also has been broadly very free thinking. But that has all been changed uh, due to Pakistani interventions. As I mentioned earlier, there is insistence that the Kashmiri women should wear veils. The disputes between Sunnis and Shias which never existed in Kashmir, they are being revived. Why? Because in Pakistan, there is hatred for Shias. Why is there hatred in Pakistan for Shias? Because they are receiving funds from Saudi Arabia, which sends millions and millions of dollars to fund mosques, madarsas, which talk about the Sunni religion as only representing the true Islam, and how Shias are infidels, or even worse than infidels. You know, there are parties, Sunni parties, which go on campaigns to kill Shias in Pakistan. So this kind of Shia Sunni amity which existed and which could be said to be part of Kashmir, that is being slowly destroyed. Not only this, India did not actually, to be fair to India, India made its share of mistakes, but they did not try to destroy Kashmiri culture. But as one of the professors says, he goes to attend a wedding of one of his relatives in Pakistani occupied Kashmir. And he says, you know, I found something very surprising. Nobody in Pakistani occupied Kashmir could speak Kashmiri. Why? Because in Pakistan, they have imposed Urdu on the entire nation. They have not allowed the flowering of different cultures. So if you go to Pakistan occupied Kashmir, it has all been Islamized. There is no possibility that people will be speaking in their own Kashmiri language. In the valley, people speak Kashmiri. But in Pakistan occupied Kashmir, there is no Kashmiri. Everybody speaks Urdu because the Pakistanis, they passed a law that in schools across the nation only Urdu will be taught. There is no you know, prospect for uh, local uh, culture to flower. So as a result of all this, the Kashmir, the true Kashmir is under threat from all these you know, radical Islamists who are crossing over, who are saying that bring back the Sharia law. Uh, so, as the professor in the play says, Kashmir will be like a young nubile bride who gets married off to a villain were it ever to join Pakistan. Pakistan will rape Kashmir day in and day out. Uh, Sheikh Abdullah once said, he made this comparison. He said, Kashmir is like a young bride which has two suitors, India and Pakistan. But as the professor says, the way Pakistan is, it's, it's a country run by the army, it's not a democracy. You have no rights in Pakistan. There are human rights watch reports which talk about what's happening in Pakistan occupied Kashmir, which we don't talk about. Our media doesn't talk about. So, uh, uh, so there is a, a great danger to Kashmiriyat from the Pakistani army administered nation. So that was it for today. Thank you Rajesh for being here with us and talking about your play and telling us about things which many of our viewers probably did not know. Uh, thanks Ananya, it's been wonderful to be with you once again to talk about a very sensitive, delicate but extremely important topic, Kashmir. Kashmir and the expulsion of hundreds of thousands of Kashmiri Pandits who were first forced to leave their ancestral home where their families had lived for thousands of years, who are now homeless or who are refugees in their own country, 
and uh, have been so for decades now with nothing being done to resettle them. And I hope this play and our discussion today will bring back some focus on their plight and what India needs to do to redress the so legitimate grievances of the Kashmiri Pandit community. Thank you for staying here with us and we'll be back with yet another video very soon.